Well, today we are going to be looking at this passage from Luke's Gospel. Now, uh, there's a, a scholar, an academic called Jean M. Twangy, and at college, the, uh, my college um, principal used to mention her quite a lot just because I think he liked the name. You know, Twangy is, I think he thought it was quite a funny name. It is quite a funny name, actually. Um, uh, but, but she has written a book. She's an American scholar, and she's written a, a couple of books in um, the last sort of 10 years or so, one of which was called Generation Me, uh, and the other called The Narcissism Epidemic. Uh, and it's just kind of focused on the rise of narcissism and a kind of the self-focus in younger generations today. <clears throat> And uh, I remember Jackie when she was doing the, I think this was the last first Wednesday that we had before uh, the lockdown, but um, Jackie was talking about the selfie. And, you know, I think, what was it? There was something about 90 million selfies. Actually, it might have been a, a regular Sunday sermon. I'm sorry, Jackie, I can't quite remember. Um, but, you know, there was millions and millions of selfies taken every day. And selfie was the word of the year, wasn't it, a few years ago? And, and there is this kind of self-obsession that happens in our culture. One of the things I've been really struck by, actually, as I've been talking to um, sort of uh, other, other parents, particularly uh, mums, of course, who come to our toddler group, is just the way that so many people now want to build a brand for themselves online. You know, a lot of people want to be um, sort of YouTube stars, they want to have their own kind of channel and they want to have their own business, they want to, you know, be a, a self-made man or, or woman. And, you know, it's almost like, you know, everyone wants to be a celebrity, you know, everyone wants their own disciples, everyone wants to be listened to. And uh, this is the culture into which I think what Jesus says here is, is really important for us to hear as Christians because it is going against the cultural grain. So what does Jesus have to say to us? Well, let's, let's dive into it. <clears throat> We're starting in um, the chapter 20, verse 41. Uh, and Jesus makes this what seems like a rather obscure point here. It, it seems at first blush. It says, why is it? Uh, said that the Messiah is the son of David um, and he quotes from Psalm 110 and he says if David calls him Lord how can he be his son? Well, what's the point that that Jesus is making here? Well the point that Jesus wants to, to get across is that normally the son implies kind of being under so in those days particularly you know being a son was something which put you under the authority of your father and, and that's just the way it worked. That's how families worked. And to an extent, it's, it's a bit like that today, but no, nothing like the way it was in these days. Now, to be a son was to be under the authority of the father. So Jesus says, why is it that David could call his son Lord? You know, David called his descendant Lord. And <clears throat> I think the reason that uh, that that he makes this point is to say actually that Jesus, the son of David, is greater than David. Now Jesus, the son of David, is greater than David. Now why does Jesus make this point from a seemingly kind of, I mean, I don't think uh, the Jewish people at the time, the Jewish leaders, really went to Psalm 110 as a messianic psalm. So why did, did Jesus go to this part? And I think the answer is that Jesus was just trying to show that he was the one who had actually understood scripture properly. He was the one who had interpreted it, in contrast to the teachers of the law who just missed it in perhaps the more, um, more clear passages. You know, the teachers of the law had completely missed uh, much of what, what the Messiah was meant to be about and about Jesus. So Jesus is saying here, he is the one who can understand and interpret <clears throat> uh, the Bible correctly against these, these sort of teachers of the law. And it leads to the question, you know, who is it who can, who can correctly show us the way to live? Who can correctly show us the way that, that God wants us to go, the way that God wants us to live? And the answer, of course, is not the teachers of the law, as we've seen all the way through these last few weeks. But the answer is Jesus himself. Now, Jesus is the one who can correctly show us uh, the way that we should go. 
And so uh, Jesus, he goes on then in verse 45 to 47, he gives a warning against the teachers of the law. He says, beware the teachers of the law. They, they like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in marketplaces and have the most important seats and places of honour. So he's saying that these people, what they really want is, the, the, is being important. You know, that that's what they really like about being teachers of the law. They like the social status it gives them. And Jesus has actually um, uh, talked about this before in Luke chapter 11, verse 43. He says, Woe to you Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. So, you know, Jesus is saying that there's nothing wrong necessarily with, um, you know, being... Uh, respectful greetings with all of these sort of things but when that becomes the most important thing when that becomes the most important thing that's a problem and I was thinking today you know that although of course we don't have um, teachers of the law in the same way I think it can apply like that a little bit with clergy or, or with bishops you know that um, the thing is that you realize when you put one of these collars on people do treat you differently and if you're wearing a purple shirt, you know, like a bishop, if you've got robes on, uh, you know, people think, oh, there's someone of, there's someone important, you know, even if it's only important in church circles, that's still something. And it's a huge temptation, actually, to, uh, to want to be important and to want to, you know, to be invited to meetings, to be, um, you know, on the, if you're a bishop in the House of Lords, for example, you know, to, to have that place of honour and respect and, and have a platform and be listened to, but not to use that uh, for God's good. And that's what Jesus goes on to say. He says, verse 47, they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Now, that when Jesus talks about widows, this is something which is, uh, is actually close to God's heart. We know from the Old Testament from Exodus, and just to give one example, Exodus chapter uh, 22, verse 22. When I can find it, there we go, Exodus 22, verse 22, this is what God says. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. So this is all the way through the Old Testament, the people of Israel looking after the widow and the fatherless was kind of seen as, you know, the, the, the biggest kind of, just what God wanted, you know, to look after the most vulnerable in society. And in those days, that was the widow and the fatherless. There was no social services uh, to look after orphans. There was no government really to, to um, you know, with, with welfare and so on. If you were a widow, if you were an orphan, then you were on your own. And so uh, that's why it was so important for them to, to look after the widow and the fatherless. But of course, there are uh, any, anyone who's vulnerable, really. Looking after people who are, are vulnerable is close to God's heart. And the teachers of the law, that's, that's not what they were doing. In fact, it says they devour uh, widows' houses. We don't know what, exactly what that means. Um, some people think that perhaps it means that um, they took money, maybe they had to look after widow's property and so they took it for themselves or whatever. You know, however it, it, it happened, this is basically what they were doing. They were taking advantage of the vulnerable rather than actually looking after them. So that they loved the, uh, and this is what Jesus is saying, they loved the, the importance they loved the status, but they didn't actually like the, the responsibilities that went with it. You know, they, they liked all of the meetings, they liked the honourable greetings, but they didn't actually want to do the right thing. Uh, and that's what Jesus uh, criticises them for. And even, even their lengthy prayers, he says, even their lengthy prayers are uh, just for show. For a show they make lengthy prayers, you know, it's just to show other people how pious they are, rather than actually because of any, any devotion to the Lord. In this last section, though, from Jesus, we see a, a complete uh, opposite to that. 
This is a completely different thing in chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, and we see a widow. I think it's not a coincidence that we see a widow in this last section, that Jesus uses her as an example. You know, of the very, the very people, the very group that the, the teachers of the law have been neglecting, Jesus says, ah, look at this widow. And it's a complete contrast with the rich. Uh, this widow, um, the rich were putting in gifts, but a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. And just to put that into perspective, I think that was about a hundredth um, of a, day, a day's wages, an average day's wages for a labourer. So really, really tiny amount that she's putting in. And um, Jesus, he sees the contrast with the rich. And, and, she, uh, and Jesus says that this widow has put in more than all the others. He says, all of these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. So this poor widow, she gave, um, she gave everything. In complete contrast with the rich, and we know that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, one of the things they loved was money. And Jesus said, in contrast, this poor woman, she gave everything she had. She didn't withhold anything. She, you know, she was the one who is truly devout and godly. In contrast with these leaders who you know, like to, like to parade their, their righteousness before others, but she was the devout one. She was the one who, who was truly godly. So what, what, can, we, what can we draw in conclusion uh, uh, from this, this passage? Again, what, one of the things that we, we often see when we go through the Gospels is that following Jesus means that we need to do things differently. You know, we don't look like the world anymore and, and we should aspire to, to beyond what the world aspires to. And I think we see this in, um, in this passage very much, that uh, particularly in, in different ways. So one of the ways is, I think, in terms of church leaders. Uh, church leaders, I think, have a, a real responsibility to think and to, to act differently to worldly uh, leaders. This is what it says in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, uh, sorry, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So Peter says that to be, um, to be a pastor, or to be a teacher, to be an elder in, in his language, whatever, however you translate that, it, as a leader of God's people, that is to be a servant. That as Jesus says, you know, he who wants to be great among you must, uh, must be servant of all. You know, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That's what Jesus says. We, we must do things differently. James uh, also, he says in James chapter 3 verse 1, that those who teach will be judged more strictly. And so that those who teach have a particular responsibility to demonstrate this. And this is why I think Jesus was so hard on the teachers of the law, because they did teach. Now, what does this mean? Of course, for, for most people, uh, we're not, we're, you know, most of us aren't church leaders in, in that respect. What does this application have? And I think I would just like to say that, you know, my part in this, I think, is to listen to what 1 Peter says. But I think for, for all of you, I hope that you hold me to account and Mark and Guy and, and you know, any other church leaders uh, who you may, may know. And this is how it works. You know, that I think there can be an unhealthy culture of deference in the church, which actually allows things to continue, which shouldn't be, be allowed to continue. So, you know, although the Bible does say that we should have respect for, for those who preach, uh, teach us the word of God, at the same time, uh, there is a responsibility to ensure that they're teaching rightly, that they're not misusing their authority 
and so on. So uh, there can be an unhealthy culture of deference in the church, which enables abuse to continue, which enables things to happen. Um, so don't let that happen. You know, be someone, if you see myself or Mark or anyone doing something to abuse our position, then, then point it out. And, you know, just make sure that it doesn't go unnoticed. Uh, because sadly, too many leaders have been uh, enabled to continue doing, doing this kind of thing for far too long. I think the other thing, though, is that it, it, this message is for ourselves. Because although we may not all be church leaders, I think we all, uh, we're all servants of God. And I think we can all be tempted to, to put our service uh, kind of first for, for our own benefit, if you like. One of the, the, uh, the things which I often think of, um, and I've seen this happen in numerous different churches, is someone gets offended and leaves um, because they weren't um, able to serve or do things in the way that they wanted. So I know that, for example, in a, a church that I know of, one person um, was in charge of the kitchen and in, you know, sort of in charge of the washing up and refreshments and so on. And when someone else came in and did things slightly differently, they got in a huff and they actually left the church because they, they thought that they were not being needed anymore. And, you know, this is the thing that our service, I've just seen this happen so many times, you know, our service can actually become our, you know, bound up with our identity and we think, oh, if I can't do that, then God doesn't want me or, or whatever. It mustn't become like that, you know, that we should be, we should be here to serve others, you know, we should be devoted to God, should be here to serve, not for our own status, but for, for what God wants us to do, for how God wants us to serve. One of the, the phrases that I learned at college, which has really stuck with me, is that servant-heartedness is more important than gifting. Servant-heartedness is more important than gifting. In other words, you'll be more useful to the Lord if you are uh, wanting to serve despite your, your gifts, rather than if you're, you're the most you know, gifted person in the world, but you don't want actually to serve God. It's much more important that you want to serve more than the, the specific gifts that you have. So that is, that's, the, uh, that's the thing. I'd just like to finish by um, mentioning a couple of books which have really helped me uh, in thinking about this. The first one is a book called Serving Without Sinking by John Hinley, which is a really helpful book about serving, you know, how we should serve, how we should think about service, and rather than being people who are trying to build our own empires, actually should serve God and how we can do that without kind of, um, you know, giving up and, and what have you. And the other book is, uh, is No Little People by Francis Schaeffer, which is a collection of his sermons. And I've just realised that I forgot, it's on the um, uh, Kindle and I forgot to bring it uh, with me up to St Mark's. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mention that now and then I'm going to read out the quote uh, on the live stream in a moment's time. Well, for you it will be in a moment's time. But uh, I'll do that in a moment. But let's just take a moment to, to reflect and then to pray and ask God to help us to be people who are not trying to build our own empires like the teachers of the law but who have a genuine, wholehearted devotion to God and a desire to serve him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to be people who take this message on board, who seek to be people who do not build our own empires, but seek instead to build your kingdom, who want to, uh, to put ourselves uh, in humility and who want to, to build others up and to serve for, for you, their, their good and for service of you. We pray that you would help us to put this into practice uh, this day and each day. In Jesus' name. Amen.